Today I'm down in Southern California driving the all-new Lincoln Nautilus for 2024. The big headline here is that Lincoln has made a better Lexus than Lexus. And that's not a slam because the Lexus RX is the best seller in this segment. And if you have one of those Lexuses on your shopping list, put your purchase on hold until you've driven a Lincoln Nautilus because this is quite simply better. And here's why. Now I know what you're thinking, better is a strong statement, but I think that the Nautilus not only looks better than the RX, but a lot of the numbers that we're gonna go over in this video are objectively better than the Lexus RX as well, especially when it comes to performance and fuel economy when comparing like to like. And that is the tricky bit that we'll get into a little bit later. But first, let's talk about the design. We get a slightly different look depending on the trim level of Nautilus that you're getting. This is the top end black label trim, so we get matrix LED headlights. We have LED headlights in every model, but the matrix technology is reserved just for the top end trim. The bottom of the bumper also changes a little bit depending on which package you get. There's a jet appearance package or a jet pack, which seems kind of like a weird name, that does change the lower portion of the bumper just a little bit. But all are gonna get a very similar grille and we all have this signature LED stripe running right through there to an illuminated Lincoln logo. It looks really good at night. And I have to say this grille looks significantly better than the outgoing Nautilus, which always had kind of a Yosemite Sam frowny face thing going on to me. To understand the Nautilus, you have to understand the phone booth size segment that it plays in. This is a mid-size two-row luxury SUV. Not every manufacturer has an entry in this specific segment. Obviously, again, the elephant in the room is the Lexus RX, but also we have something like the Jeep Grand Cherokee, which can get up to $80,000 when fully loaded. The Mercedes-Benz GLE and the BMW X5, they're just a little bit longer than this, but they were designed to have a teeny tiny third row in the back. And if you want a three row Lincoln, that would be the Aviator or of course the Navigator, different sizes for different people's needs. You can look at this not just as a competitor to the RX, but also as an upgrade from something like an Acura RDX or a Volvo XC60 or a BMW X3. If you want more room on the inside and you don't wanna pay that much more for it, you should take a look at this Lincoln rather than some of the larger options in those European competitions lines. For 2024, Lincoln has simplified the Nautilus lineup a little bit to three different trims, but there's still a lot of customization available, including four different wheel sizes and a ton of different wheel options within those wheel sizes as well. This is simply one of the 22 inch wheels offered. You can also get 21 inch wheels, 20 inch wheels, or 19 inch wheels if you're worried about getting a little bit of extra tire cushion. A nice touch though, is that all of the tires are 255 in width. That is notably wider than the base tires we find on a lot of the competition. A distinctive design element on the Nautilus are these Lincoln Continental-like electronic door handles, both front and rear. They really clean up the lines of the vehicle and they give it a distinctive appearance versus the competition. We also find touch controls for the lock and unlock buttons right here on the pillars. The design of a dedicated two-row SUV in this segment tends to be a little bit different than the two-row, three-row options, most notably in the back, where we generally find a bit more of a raked design, but Lincoln decided to keep the Nautilus a lot more vertical than the Lexus RX, and that significantly improves the cargo practicality in the back. We have a very distinctive light strip running right across here with progressive red turn signals. Kind of wish they were amber. Down here at the bottom, we find hidden exhaust tips and these sort of faux, I guess, homage to an exhaust tip going on down there. That doesn't offend me quite as much as what we find in some Audi models, but I kind of wish they had just cleaned up the bumper and just forgotten about that imitation exhaust. No luxury car would be complete without an exclusive LED digital signature, so of course we get one here in the Lincoln. As you can see, it starts at the Lincoln logo and then it expands out there and then illuminates the side. And then it basically does the reverse when you lock the car as well. It kind of collapses up and then ends with that Lincoln logo fading out. Out back, we get even more of a song and dance when we lock and unlock the vehicle. You can see that it sort of builds there. The Lincoln logo starts lighting up from the center outwards, and then we get the LED bar that expands from the outside. And then when we lock it, we get basically the same sort of thing in reverse, but you'll see that rolls up, and then it counts down with just the C being illuminated at the end. If you want a V6 engine under the hood of your Nautilus, act fast because that's last year's model for 2024, we're only gonna find two liter four cylinder turbos under this hood. The base engine produces 250 horsepower, 280 pound feet of torque. It's mated to a standard eight speed automatic transmission and you'll get 24 miles per gallon in every version of that because all wheel drive is also standard for 2024. So if you look at Nautilus pricing and it seems a little bit higher than some of the competition, 
Keep in mind that all-wheel drive is standard here. It's optional on the majority of the competitors. If you want more power and better fuel economy, you want the 2.0-liter turbo hybrid. This is apparently going to be about half of all Nautilus sales in North America, and I think it's easy to see why. System horsepower comes in at 310 horsepower, 295 pound-feet of torque, and you'll get 30 miles per gallon with a mechanical all-wheel drive system not an e-all-wheel drive system like we find in the Lexus RX. So if you're looking for better fuel economy and better wet weather traction or winter weather traction, you definitely want to take a look at this over the e-all-wheel drive competition, including something like a plug-in hybrid XC60 or XC90, even though Volvo does a pretty decent job with their all-wheel drive setup. The mechanical all-wheel drive system isn't the only notable thing about this drivetrain. The hybrid system uses the same basic design that Lincoln has used for a while, that we also find in the Lincoln Corsair, with an engine that produces a heap more power, about 300 horsepower in its own right. So if you're looking for the smoothest hybrid in this segment that doesn't have stepped automatic gears, like you find in a Lexus RX 500H or a Volvo Recharge, you want to take a look at this system. Also, if you're concerned about how much power you have when the battery is completely depleted, you want to take a look at this because, again, about 300 horsepower without the battery, and you find significantly less in something like an RX 350H or the RX 450H+. Plus. Now, one disclaimer, there's no plug-in hybrid version of the Nautilus, but there is that plug-in hybrid RX that I really like. So if you want to know more about that, be sure and stay tuned for that video. It's coming up pretty soon. For my body shape at six feet tall, I find the front seats among the most comfortable in this segment. Not quite as comfortable as the ones in the XC60 or XC90, but pretty darn close. And this has one of the best front seat massages available. That's of course the model we're taking a look at today because this is the most fully loaded version with the 24-way power Lincoln seats. This includes the seat bottom cushion that splits, that way you can extend one leg further than the other in case you have one leg that's longer than the other or you like doing the Captain Morgan while you drive. Either way you slice it, lots of adjustability. We have the inflatable seat bottom bolsters, seat back bolsters. We have a power tilt telescopic memory linked steering column three position memory over there on the door and the front passenger seat has the exact same range of motion as the driver's seat. There's so many ways to adjust the front seats that they put some of the controls here in the central touchscreen. This is where we would adjust the front seat massage. If I go over here to seat, this is also where we would adjust things like inflating or deflating the side bolsters or the seat back bolsters. You can also adjust the various inflatable sections of that lumbar support, but you cannot adjust the seat back curvature in this particular model. Taller drivers and taller front passengers are certainly going to appreciate the fact that the front seats move pretty far rearward, but even when they're all the way back, there is just a ton of legroom back here. And I really appreciate some of the attention to detail, like we have soft touch plastics all on the backs of the seat here, soft touch plastics on the rear doors, and everything is color matched really nicely. So on the camera, it may appear that the seat backs are charcoal or black, they're actually brown, matching all of the brown going on up there on the dashboard. And depending on the interior color you get, they match that other interior two-tone color scheme. Moving over here to the middle seat position, my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling, but my head's not touching the ceiling. Headroom is going to be a little bit better than the Lexus RX, or about the same as the RX, depending on the version you get. But you will find that some of the European SUV competition that's a little bit boxier than this, is actually going to have a little bit more headroom in the way back, especially some of those three-row options, because of course there's a third row back there. But scooting over to this side, you'll really see how much legroom is going on. This front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. It's actually a little bit more reclined than I would normally sit in, but absolutely gobs and gobs of legroom is happening back here. This is the kind of vehicle where you would have no problem fitting rear-facing child seats, convertible seats, infant seats, etc. back here behind pretty tall drivers up front. Certainly one reason to upgrade from some of those smaller crossovers that may cost you as much as the larger Lincoln Nautilus. I also appreciate the fact that the center shoulder belt does not come out of the ceiling. It comes out of the seat back itself. That's an awful lot more convenient. We have a center armrest here with some additional storage and cup holders. And then, of course, the rear seats fold almost flat with the cargo area in the back. Lincoln really wanted to give us a big cargo area in the rear, so these are a little bit of a ramp up, but still absolutely tons of room here. Behind the power hatch, we find 36 cubic feet of storage space. That's six cubic feet more than you'll find in the Lexus RX, putting this decidedly towards the top of this segment. Even if you include some larger three-row vehicles, this has a very large cargo area in the back. And that's all because of the way they decided to design the Nautilus with this relatively vertical hatch in the rear, really helping maximize that cargo capacity. 
And even more impressively, if I take the luggage out of here, we find something that we don't find in very many hybrids in America, an actual spare tire under the load floor. Now, you wouldn't be able to fit a full-size spare in here because the full-size tires of this vehicle are so wide, but I appreciate the fact that we have a tire here rather than just a can of fix-a-flat. There's also a little bit of extra storage space around there. I also appreciate the fact that Lincoln color matches the carpet back here and the plastics on the rear to the plastics up front, although obviously under that cover it's charcoal. The interior design of the Nautilus has been controversial in some circles, but I think it's actually one of the reasons to get this over the competition. We have an enormous amount of screen real estate, but it's more than just the number of screens or the size of the screens, it's actually the way they function for me. The other thing that's been controversial is the shape of the steering wheel, so let's talk about that first. It's sort of oval because the flat bottom lets you get in and out of the vehicle a little bit more easily. It's flat topped because of the screen setup and what's going on behind. We have 48 inches of screen real estate. That's how Lincoln is measuring things across all the way from the driver's side all the way over there to the passenger side. It is definitely a lot of screen, but it's actually two separate screens. You can see the seam right there in the middle. On this side, the driver's side, we have a moving map display that can be either car driven or driven by Android Auto or your Apple smartphone, depending on what you have connected. We then have transmission readouts, engine temperature, things like that. You'll notice this is quite far away from the driver and it is not a touch enabled display for a reason, because it's so far. We have a stitched upper section of the dashboard. Everything in here is really elegantly done, I have to say. I like the seams, I like the stitching and the quality. And having the displays this far away from the driver allowed them to give you a really low dashboard. So it really gives the interior this sense of space. Over here on the middle of this display, we have our speedometer, active safety systems, fuel level, headlights, things like that. On the passenger side, we have, I guess you might say, a passenger-centric display, but honestly, it's really still more of a driver-centric display. There are configurable widgets over there and everything is controlled via this central LCD that's also standard. If you have smartphone integration active, you can choose whether you want that to occupy more or less screen real estate. That's kind of a nice touch right there, so you can have that home menu button or those other buttons there active all the time. We also have our climate control buttons down here, little widgets over there for the system, like the integrated Google navigation, that's right there. This little option here is how you configure that passenger display. So you can choose what modules you want to be up there, whether you only want two modules. Maybe you don't want any modules all the time. Maybe you want the entire screen to have more of a calm effect. You can slide that slider and then those screens just give you that wallpaper view with just the driver oriented information right over there. It's a really elegant look that gives you a lot of customization ability. As you might have guessed, the colors are adjustable there. The air vents moving down from there on the dashboard, those are electronically controlled. That is another somewhat controversial option. You control them via the climate control settings in here. It's very Tesla-like, you just sort of drag your finger and you move them around, or you can choose to have the air vents moving all the time, basically. So you can just choose motion, you can choose to have it directly on your body, you can have it directly off your body, or I guess indirectly off your body if you want. So lots of options there. I do kind of like this motion option personally. Moving back over to the doors, again, we find lots of high quality materials in the upper section of the door, stitched materials there, stitched imitation leather, stitched armrest right there, and then harder plastics at the bottom of the door to help improve durability. If you really want everything coated in leather, you'll find that somewhere else. This uh, lower section in ivory and that lower section in brown, those are both hard plastics. I like the color matching here, however. I like the fact that we have a bunch of different color options and things like the glove box lid, that's a soft touch injection molded material, has a nice premium feel to it. I wasn't able to bring my tablet computer along, but I suspect you'd be able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside there. The seats, those are again, a very similar design to what we find in other Lincoln models with that split seat bottom cushion right there. Lots of stitching going on in this particular model with the adjustable inflatable side bolsters as well. The driver and front passenger have height adjustable shoulder belts and height adjustable head restraints. Travis is back there in the second row. Head, you know, somewhat close to the ceiling, but a little bit more headroom than you'd find in some of the competition. Big panoramic moonroof there with the shade partially open. Below the central control screen, we find two more air vents. Kind of nice that we have air vents up top by the engine start stop button and air vents here, so you can get a lot of air to your torso if you want. 
The piano key shifter has been revised. Park over here, drive low over there. No paddles on the back of the steering wheel. I do think that's a bit of a miss. We have the auto brake hold right there. Max defrost over there. I am surprised that is separate from the other controls. There's a button for the camera system over here. And in case you're wondering, Lincoln does put the camera display nice and high up top, but I kind of wish that the 360 degree camera display was maybe a little bit larger or perhaps more on the central screen so that way you could get a slightly bigger view. Moving back down here, we have the drive mode selector, big power and volume knob, crystal design right there, autonomous parking option there. Down here, you'll notice the lid is not quite closed because the wireless charging mat is just not quite big enough for some of the larger smartphones in cases. If this phone was out of its case, it would fit in there a little bit more easily with the lid closed. And some of the larger Android phones that are a little bit taller will definitely have troubles fitting in that slot right there, especially with cases. You could also connect your phone via USB right over there with the two USB ports, USB-C and USB-A. Two big cup holders there. You can close off that area with the roller slider. And then in here we have more USB charge ports, two USB-C charge ports, and then we have four USB-C charge ports for the rear passengers. So lots and lots of USB-C going on in here. Back over on the driver's side, we have the attention monitoring system right there on the steering column for Blue Cruise. Again, that oval steering wheel. We have contextual buttons on the outside of the wheel. And as you can see, it's kind of a floating module. You can actually see my fingers behind there. You know what option you're gonna choose by actually looking up there on the screen. So for instance, if I have cruise control enabled, then these other portions of the button become something else. Again, you'll know what it is up there. Over here on this side, exactly the same things going on on that section of that large screen. It's actually more intuitive than it might look at first glance. Lincoln has gone button minimalist, but they haven't removed all the buttons. So we still find things like the fuel door, trunk, dimmer controls over here and headlight controls as physical buttons. And obviously regular buttons over here for the window switches, door locks, seat memory controls, etc. Metal speaker grills there for the Revel audio system. And then over here we have a door release that reminds me an awful lot of what we see in the Mustang Mach-E. Lincoln doesn't use an enormous amount of real wood trim in this interior, but it is here. It's subtly placed right there between the brown and the ivory sections of this dashboard. In this particular model, it's a shiny striped wood. You can get some open pour wood and some different finishes depending on the model you're looking at. And if you look closely, this may actually catch people by surprise, but the wood trim is also right there in that button bank. It is interesting that the wood does not span the entire button bank or the console lid. I think I actually would have liked to have seen some wood here on this roller top, but it is nice that we have it there. And we also again have it over here on the passenger side on some of those touch points. The first thing I noticed out on the road is definitely the square around steering wheel. It takes a bit of getting used to, but over the course of the day, I am adjusting. Part of the reason we have that relatively flat top design is because of where the LCD cluster is. And of course, just that enormous bank of LCD across the front of the vehicle. I really appreciate its position more than I did when I first saw the concept photos of this vehicle. It really is a faithful blend of LCD instrument cluster and head up display because the LCD is further away from the driver, meaning that it's gonna take less time for your eyes to focus on the display, focus on the road, focus on the display, etc. It also puts all that information a little bit higher up, a little bit more in your eye line when you're driving out on the road. And then of course, there's the fact that it looks pretty darn cool. The other thing you're gonna notice is how smooth this hybrid drivetrain is. And again, I think this really is the drivetrain option that I would get if I was shopping for a Nautilus. It's quick, it's smooth. If I floor it, we get pretty instant acceleration thanks to the electric motors. And there is just a very small hint of turbo lag because of course, most of the power is coming from that turbocharged engine when you're accelerating. There's a little bit of electric boost, but mostly it's just that two liter turbo helping you out there. So the acceleration profile is a little bit different than in a Lexus hybrid where we don't have a turbocharged engine. And I am of course talking about the 350H or the 450H plus because the 500H that does have a turbo, but it's gonna feel very different than this. This is significantly smoother. If you're just driving this moderately aggressively out on this road, the engine is super quiet. Everything is very hushed. The power delivery is incredibly linear. The braking is very smooth. And that's not at all how I would describe the 500H in the RX. And there's a reason for that. It's due to the design of that hybrid system. As I mentioned earlier, this does not have a stepped automatic transmission. And generally speaking, in Lexus hybrids, we haven't either. That's why there's been this definite synergy between Lincoln hybrids and Lexus hybrids as far as how they drive. 
but with the RX 500H, they went in a very different direction. They wanted it to be sportier, they say, but it comes across honestly as just less refined. You get the shifts from the automatic transmission. They're not the smoothest because it doesn't have a torque converter. You do get a reasonable amount of power, but it doesn't have a mechanical all wheel drive system. So you're always gonna get torque steer. And even though we have a lot of power in this, you don't get the same kind of torque steer because we have a mechanical all wheel drive system. So it can send that power to the rear and really for the most part, eliminate that. Now by all appearances, the RX 500H and the RX 450H Plus may actually be a little bit swifter than this zero to 60. In our initial tests out here at 4,000 feet, mind you, we were running about 6.4 seconds zero to 60. Keep in mind the elevation and the fact that Travis is in the seat next to me. And you know, he's not heavy, but he's not exactly a featherweight either. Bearing in mind that I'm not driving the Nautilus on our usual test route, handling is definitely solid and the ride quality is excellent. And I think that Lincoln has found exactly the right balance between those two. We have wide 255 with tires, so the level of grip is pretty decent. Obviously these are not the grippiest tire out there, but on this kind of road surface, you can have a reasonable amount of fun. And I'm in the softest drive mode, which I think actually suits the Nautilus the best. I could firm things up with the adaptive suspension system if I wanted to, but even in this normal drive mode, it doesn't come across as wallowy. If I were to stab on the brakes there, we don't get too much dive, we don't get too much tip if I floor it, and we get a reasonable amount of grip as well. Now, if you start pushing this harder, you will realize that the Nautilus is heavier than something like a BMW X3. This is not gonna be that kind of sporty, but this is also notably bigger than the BMW. It has a huge back seat back there. We get more rear seat legroom than we find in a BMW X5 with better fuel economy, and I think actually a slightly better ride. The ride quality in the BMW X5 is excellent, and oddly enough, in my mind driving this, I'm coming up with a lot more BMW X5 comparisons in some areas than Lexus RX comparisons. The cabin definitely seems to be about as quiet as the X5. You'll obviously have to stay tuned for our official cabin noise scores, but this definitely appears to be quieter and more refined than the Lexus cabin. One thing you will definitely notice if I slow down here and then floor it, is we get a lot less engine noise in the cabin. And the engine noise you do get in the cabin has kind of a nice throaty rumble. It's in the distance, it's not very loud, it's definitely isolated. And the 2.4 liter turbo, especially in the Lexus lineup, comes across as pretty darn gruff. And the two and a half liter hybrid engine, it's the same one that we find in the RAV4. It's not overly refined. And while that's fine in a lot of models, the Highlander, the RAV4, etc., I think by the time you've plugged it into a Lexus product, it's fine if you can't hear much of it and you just hear a bit too much in the cabin. At this point in time, it's a little bit difficult to talk about fuel economy because we've been driving up and down slopes. We went from approximately sea level up to 4,000 feet, and this has spent most of its day idling for the photo shoot, so right now it's averaging about 15 miles per gallon. But earlier in the day when we were doing just a city loop, we were averaging around 35, which is out indexing the EPA score just a little bit. And we'll go ahead and reset the fuel economy meter here for the rest of our journey, and then just post those numbers up there on the top of the screen. Here's a better look at the expanse of LCD across the dashboard. Again, this display is further away from the driver, so it means if I'm focusing on that and then focusing on the road, it doesn't take quite as much time for my eyes to adjust versus an LCD instrument cluster that I'd be looking at through the steering wheel, but would be considerably lower in the dashboard. So not only does it take less time to focus, it's really more in line with my eyes as I'm supposed to be looking at the road. I also really love the fact that we have the map over there. That's a really nice touch. The extra information on the side, that's kind of cool as well, but I also like the fact that it's useful to the driver in a way, and if we take a look at something like the passenger screen on a Jeep Grand Cherokee, which you could consider a, co a competitor to this, it's just over there on the passenger side. It's not useful to the driver, and I really don't find it very useful to the passenger either. In this, even if I want to look over there to the fuel economy or the trip computer, my eyes are still much closer to the road. The other thing it has the effect of doing is really debulking the dashboard, dropping this down so it really gives you a more expansive, more open and airy feel, which is also kind of nice. And if you'd rather have a less busy dashboard, you can always engage the comm mode. Travis has just done that, and as you can see, it definitely reduces the clutter there. We don't get the moving map display. You could still have that down here, of course, if you wanted to on this display. I love the fact that we have all those options to choose from. And then, of course, you can change the backgrounds as I showed you earlier. If you're still not convinced that the hybrid model is the way to go, you might want to check out the non-hybrid Nautilus. 
and honestly, there's not too much of a penalty to be paid. Obviously, it produces less power. The 0-60 to 60 time, it's probably pretty similar, however. Sometimes it feels just about as peppy as the hybrid model. Keep in mind, the hybrid system obviously adds some weight to the vehicle. When the road really starts winding like the road we're on now, you will notice that the non-hybrid feels a little bit lighter and a little bit more nimble than the hybrid model. That's just to be expected. But the difference is not as large as you find in some of the competitive hybrids out there, or plug-in hybrids, because we still have a mechanical all-wheel drive system here. So when you're power on in the corners, it has that same traditional feel, whether we're talking about the hybrid or the non-hybrid. Now to the nitty gritty. The Nautilus is going to be more expensive than a base Lexus RX. It starts at $50,415, but remember, all wheel drive is standard, as is that enormous 48 inch LCD setup in the dashboard. If you want the hybrid drivetrain, and I think you do, it's just a $1,500 option, and you can get it even on the base version of the Nautilus. I really appreciate the fact that Lincoln has done that. If you're interested in the hybrid, it's about $2,000 more than the base Lexus RX 350h, but you get significantly more power out of this system. You have to sacrifice a little bit of fuel economy, but you also get a better mechanical all-wheel drive setup than the e-all-wheel drive system that we find in the Lexus. You have to decide, are you willing to give up about 6 miles per gallon, maybe about 4 or 5 miles per gallon in real-world driving in order to get the 310 horsepower system, which again, significantly faster 0 to 60. Now, if you want some of the nicer things that you've seen on this model, you have to start working your way up the ladder. If you want Blue Cruise, the upgraded leather interior, if you want to add options like a panoramic moonroof, if you want the 14 or 28 speaker audio system, or the 24-way seats, then you have to step up to the reserve trim for $54,750. And then for those snazzier bits, you have to start adding options, which could get you up to about $67,000 on that reserve model. Now, if you want everything on your next Lincoln, be prepared to pay even more. The black label is going to start at $74,250. This is a black label trim. It gives you some unique interior themes. It, of course, comes fully loaded. Really, the only option is the jet appearance package on the outside. And, of course, you get the black label member benefits. Depending on whether or not that's important to you, you could choose this over the reserve trim and get a few nicer touches. But I think a lot of folks are probably going to be happy with that loaded reserve trim. And I also like the navy blue interior that you find in that model. If $74,000 sounds expensive to you, hang on to your hats because the competition gets more expensive. Obviously, for my complete battery of comparisons and tests, you're going to have to wait until I can get one of these at home to run it through those tests, but let's roll through the competition real quick here. Obviously, elephant in the room, Lexus RX that I keep mentioning. If you want the RX 500h, which is honestly the best competitor to this, not the base hybrid, that's going to be $64,100. It's going to give you similar levels of performance, but a significantly less refined experience. And that's my big complaint and the big surprise about that RX 500h. It has a six-speed automatic transmission, no torque converter, and a single motor up front. It's just not as smooth as the RX 350h or the RX 550h+, Plus, which are both about as smooth as this Lincoln system, except that the Lincoln system gives you more power than either of those hybrid setups. Now, on the Lexus side, you do get better fuel economy in the RX 350 and the RX 450H+, Plus, and the H+, Plus is, of course, going to give you an all-electric range. But it's also going to start at 70580 which is significantly more expensive than an entry-level version of this. And it will go up to about the same price as a fully loaded version of this. So you have to decide, do you want the plug-in hybrid range, and is it worth a lot of extra cash? If you are interested in plug-in hybrids, there is, of course, the Jeep Grand Cherokee Summit Reserve 4xE. Quite a mouthful. 79150 is what that model will start at. So more expensive, actually, than this model here. You do, of course, get a rear-wheel drive drivetrain, but you're going to be paying an awful lot for that Jeep logo. I like the interior design of the Jeep. I think it stacks up really well against this, but I find these seats more comfortable, and this dashboard setup is definitely more impressive than that dashboard setup, even with the passenger screen that we find in the Grand Cherokee. There are a few nicer touches here and there in the Grand Cherokee, but there are also a few nicer touches in this, and on balance, I'd probably get the Nautilus unless you want the all-wheel drive off-road capability. If you don't need the plug-in hybrid, a Grand Cherokee Summit starts at $67,515, and the Summit Reserve is over $70,000, so still more expensive, actually, than this Lincoln Nautilus. A BMW X5 starts at $65,200. A Mercedes-Benz GLE starts a little bit around there, $62,650, a little bit more expensive but they will both get significantly more expensive than the Lincoln. So 
any way you slice it, Lincoln has a solid value proposition going, and you know that there are gonna be more discounts on the Lincoln dealer lot, a little bit more cash on the hood than we find on the Lexus. So in reality, out the door pricing for a base version of the Nautilus, it's possible, even though the MSRP is a bit higher, could actually cost you a little bit less than that Lexus. And I would certainly choose the Nautilus over the Lexus. I think it looks better inside and out. The Lexus is a little controversial in terms of its styling on the outside. I like the interior in the RX more than I thought after having spent a week with it. This is still more luxurious, more premium feeling. The wood looks nicer, the seats are more comfortable, the audio system is better. Really, in just about every way that I can think of, except for the five miles per gallon of fuel economy, this is quite simply better than the Lexus RX. Before we go, we should talk about the elephant in the room, however. This is built in China. And for some folks, that is going to be a problem. Now, the reason that it's able to be built in China and not have a fantastic tariff on the hood is because the Ford Motor Company also builds models in the United States and ships them to China. So for every vehicle that you can ship to China, you can escape the tariff on a vehicle built in China, shipped to the United States. So depending on how you want to look at it, uh, you know, I will let you deal with that yourself. I will say, however, that oddly the Lincoln Nautilus has never been built in the United States because the previous version was built in Canada. And a lot of the competition, it's not built in the United States either, although the German options are. Let me know if that matters at all to you down there. If you are looking for the best entry in this segment, I think it's going to be the Nautilus at the moment. But if for geopolitical reasons you have a problem with China, then you know you might want to take a look at a Japanese built Lexus RX or a Canadian built Jeep or an American built uh, vehicle with a German brand on the hood. Let me know what you think about that. Hit me up down there on the comment section. Uh, be sure and hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Like, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. Find us on Twitters, the X's, the Instagrams, the threads, and ever find us all those places. Just, you know, use the Googles. See all of you later.